Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Morning Musings. My name is Daniel Rogers, and I'll be standing in for Don Preston throughout the entirety of this week uh, as he and his wife, Jen, return back uh, for some more tests and things like that. Um, now, I want to show you a book real quick before we get started, and it's called The 23rd Psalm by Dr. William Bell. And this book is fantastic in terms of its exegesis of Scripture, but also in terms of the comfort that it gives in us concerning the things of God. I hope that you'll get a copy of this uh, short book and read it and enjoy it and pass it along to someone else so that they can read as well. This week, we're going to be talking about the land promises of the Old Testament. The land promises are something that many individuals uh, get caught up on in studying biblical prophecy. And it's one of the reasons uh, that some choose a more physical fulfillment of those things instead of a heavenly fulfillment of those promises. That is, all the promises of the Old Testament. When an individual reads Isaiah 11, and they see that the wolf and the lamb and the lion and the calf and all these things would, would be pleasant with each other, uh, they can't help but look at that as some sort of physical fulfillment or earthly fulfillment. But I'm going to suggest to you that that uh, type of outlook on prophecy is not according to the Scripture. What that type of look on prophecy does is it puts back on the veil of the Old Testament and it fails to utilize the interpretation that the New Testament writers give us as they go back and as they exegete the scriptures. You see what I mean? Do you see what I mean by that? You see, if we just look at the Old Testament and trying to interpret the Old Testament without looking at it through the lens of the New, we're going to miss the point of the Old Testament prophecies. And we're going to miss the point of the Old Testament scriptures. You see, the Bible plainly tells us that if the law is read without Christ in view, then you're going to miss the point of those prophecies and of those promises. In the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul very meticulously lays all of this out for us uh, in just about 18 verses or so. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, the Bible says, beginning in verse 12, Therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech. Unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face, so that the children of Israel could not steadily uh, look at the end of what was passing away. They could not see the goal. But their minds were blinded. For until this day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament, because the veil is taken away in Christ. But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now here we have a, a, a very important thing we need to understand when reading the Old Testament. Sometimes we might get in danger of putting a veil back on our face, whenever we are trying to read the Old Testament because we forget and fail to look at that through the eyes of Christ. Instead, we're looking at it through the eyes of those um, in the Old Testament who we are told had a veil over their face, and we are also told that they did not understand the timing or the nature of those prophecies. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verses 10 through 12 teach us that. So in order to properly understand the Old Testament, we have to look at it through the lens of Christ. The veil is lifted in Christ, so it's in Christ that we ought to stay when trying to understand those things. Let's give a, uh, a quick example concerning that. We have in the Old Testament the model of uh, the tabernacle. And the earthly tabernacle had all of its measurements. It had all of its appropriate uh, instructions on how to build it, how to construct it, how to cleanse it, how to uh, work in it and operate in it how often those things should go, how often they, uh, how often that the sacrifices should be made, if they should be made, if they shouldn't be made, all these things connected with the earthly tabernacle and restrictions regarding it. And yet, that tabernacle was not the goal. That tabernacle was not the ultimate fulfillment of the promises made to Abraham. There was something bigger, something greater uh, coming in the future. And that something bigger, something greater coming in the future is Christ and how we are members of his body. And as members of his body, we are God's building. We are the tabernacle. Well, we are the dwelling place of God 
as the body of Christ. Now see, you don't get that just by reading the Old Testament without the New Testament's help. You have to look through the eyes of Christ, or through the lens of the cross of Christ, in order to begin to understand these things. You have to look at how the New Testament uh, writers interpret those, because it, because it is to them that the Holy Spirit was given to guide them into all truth. And so what we're going to be doing this week is taking a look uh, further at some of the things of uh, the Old Testament, specifically concerning the land promises, properly interpreting them, and showing how they have their fulfillment in Christ. To give you another brief example of that, we in Matthew chapter 5, we have the Beatitudes. And I'm going to actually show you uh, this text here on your screen. In Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 3, we have the Beatitudes, and he says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now one begins to ask, how would the meek inherit the earth? What is this uh, talking about? In order to understand this, you have to understand uh, what the Beatitudes are all concerning. And they begin with the kingdom of heaven, and they end with the kingdom of heaven, as he, as he shows us in verse 10. So in order to understand the middle section of the Beatitudes, you have to understand the kingdom of heaven, verses 3 through verse 10. The timing of the kingdom of heaven was said to be at hand, and so the inheriting of this earth must be at hand from a first century perspective. The nature of the kingdom of heaven is not of this world, as Jesus tells us in the book of John. And therefore, the nature of this earth must be not of this world. That's a short example, but I hope it's something that you can take and run with uh, and continue to follow us as we go through this week. Thank you so much for being here, and I hope that you'll get a copy of the 23rd Psalm by William Bell, and I hope that you'll stay tuned tomorrow and the next day and the next day as we learn more and more about the Word of God. Uh, I'll see you later. God bless you, and have a great day.